when people are witnessing uh, UFOs, as we're all witnessing now through high def video and so forth, and 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 so and then of course you have the component of of, of ESP research, and it starts to suggest to me that our minds are not purely local, and that we are able to perceive among different modes of reality that are as concrete and real as the chair that I'm sitting on. But what in the world does ESP and UFOs have to do with the power of our minds to shape reality? Author Mitch Horowitz explains that all three phenomena may draw on string theory and quantum physics experiments that could explain all of them. And there's some very fascinating and interesting connections. In this, the third part of our four-part interview series, we also talk about how to apply these mind-blowing ideas in our daily lives and how to find the deepest and most authentic desires that we have to take into our manifestation practices. One of the things that really excited me about Daydream Believer was how you drew connections between mind power, PSI, ESP, divination, UFOs, and that those are traditionally, those other areas are something that New Thought uh, ignores or marginalizes uh, and keeps those things pretty siloed. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you see them as connected. Yeah, well, I, I, I tend to be very empirical, maybe to a fault. I. I, I, I feel the pain that William James felt, I think, when he wrote about his own inability to kind of let the door of the psyche just fly off its hinges and allow in different um, influences, maybe unseen influences, maybe cosmic influences. James was suffering from a very serious heart condition towards the end of his life, and he was making an effort to use methods from New Thought, Christian Science, and he felt like he was at a disadvantage in, in, in some regards. And I feel some of that myself, and I, I gravitate towards um, uh, traditional empiricism. And I am very excited by the decades of research that's gone into the uh, academic study of uh, ESP, precognition, um, uh, psychokinesis, you know, extra physical abilities of the mind. And I made a determination in Daydream Believer to write uh, a really substantial chapter where I make a, a great effort to defend the validity of these findings. Because it seems to me, if we have definitive statistical evidence in clinical settings of the uh, uh, powers of the mind to demonstrate ESP, extrasensory per perception, then we're within spitting distance of some kind of um, abilities of the mind to get things done in ways that go beyond uh, ordinary motor skill, cognition, sens sensory experience. And so we're kind of um, um, in an attached house, we'll say, to thought causation. It's not exactly the same house, but it's an attached house, and this is a very close neighbor. So I wanted to to try to develop these related ideas. UFOs are another example, something that you've written about, where you know the case has been made to me, and I find it persuasive that it's, it's actually easier, according to our current models of reality, to explain UFOs as interdimensional than it is to explain them as extraterrestrial in the conventional sense. And that sounds sort of far out. You know, I'm, I'm making the case that, you know, well, the interdimensional thesis is more practical. It's easier. But it actually is easier in terms of the distance and speed and velocity that a craft would have to go through to come from, a, you know, someplace many light years away. Of course, there are other models of reality, like so-called cosmic wormholes, that would allow distances to be spanned. But that is, again, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just a theory. It hasn't really been concretely tested, just like string theory is a model. And I think string theory and, and, and certain interpretations of quantum theory go together very elegantly. And look, it's a scent trail. It's a scent trail. And the suggestion is that maybe this stuff that, that, that we're seeing and that we now have on ra radar, uh, video, high-def video, not to mention uh, an extraordinary range of, of testimony, which becomes its own record. Maybe um, 
This stuff can be explained interdimensionally, and we catch glimpses of interdimensionality through perception. It's, it's, it's a, it, it responds to perception, and this starts to sound a lot like some of the ideas that Neville Goddard talks about. You know, the, the, the very perception, if it can be cultivated, brings about the experience of the thing itself from an infinitude of happenings. And Neville would always point out that you don't manifest something so much as it already is. It already is. Everything already is. That goes really eloquently and really well with um, aspects of quantum theory, aspects of string theory, with explanations as to what may be going on when people are witnessing uh, UFOs, as we're all witnessing now through high def video and so forth. And 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 so. And then, of course, you have the component of, of, of ESP research, and it starts to suggest to me that our minds are not purely local and that we are able to perceive among different modes of reality that are as concrete and real as the chair that I'm sitting on, but that we are not normally able to access. And sometimes, for whatever reason, and I guess that's what we're in search of is, is the how, uh, we're able to access these other states of being. So I, I feel very convinced that extra physicality of the mind is a given in our generation. We know so little about it, so little about it, but uh, people, we all sort of, in, in a certain sense, with or without consent, with or without enthusiasm, with or without willingness, we're all kind of participating in, in, that, in that probing in this generation. Okay, and, and one of the things you mentioned as well is that we we sort of are selecting from existing potentialities versus manifesting something new. Um, yeah. It's funny, uh, the thought experiment known as Schrodinger's cat goes back to the mid-1930s, and yet it's, it's, it's not quite a century old, but it feels as radical today as when it was first enunciated. Without going into the details, the physicist Erwin Schrodinger determined that the, the findings within quantum mechanics, the trackable, replicable findings, were so fantastic that what it reveals to us is a world of infinitude, a world where everything is going on at once. So in his thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat, you would have to have a, a so-called dead alive cat uh, uh, if, you, if you conducted this experiment according to the terms of particle physics, where everything is everywhere at once until a, a measurement is made, and only when a measurement is made does a particle that's in a state of infinitude settle down in one local place. So, according to Schrodinger's thought experiment, which enraptured the whole field, you have to allow for infinite outcomes. And, my God, you know, no matter how many times one restates the Schrodinger's cat experiment, or in what terms, there are several different versions of it, it sounds as fantastic today as it did generations ago, because it challenges it challenges all commonly observed observation, and everything in us wants to say no to it. You know, water is wet, and there's just one of me, and there aren't dead alive cats, and there isn't an infinitude of stuff going on. And, uh, and yet, not only from Schrodinger's cat, but we know from the theories of Einstein now proven that time is relative, in fact, that uh, time slows down for an observer who's moving at or near light speed, and in fact, Astronauts in our own era, although they're moving nowhere near the velocity of light speed, do experience minute reductions in aging. It's absolutely incredible, and it's absolutely true. Time is conditional. And we know all this stuff intellectually. We know it all intellectually, <laughs> and yet we have to live under certain laws. You know, that's why I say we experience many different laws and forces. I can't tell somebody, well, linear time is just a... Uh, uh, a thought figment. You know, linear time is just a necessary device for five sensory beings to get through life. So it doesn't matter whether I show up on time or not. Well, of course it matters. You know, if I don't do that, then the world is chaos and nothing could get done. So there's a perfect example of our understanding that time is conditional. Time bends based on velocity, based on gravity. We know this. And yet, we still have to obey, the vast majority of the time, the ordinary 
r rules of the road, you know, so to speak. I mean, I, I know that there's no such thing as up and down. If I say which way is up, you know, I point that way, but uh, somebody watching in Australia points to my, to my sensory apparatus, points that way, and, and he or she is, of course, correct. You know, we're, we're held in place by this thing called gravity, which seems to be mass attracted to itself. There's no real up and down. I mean, th that's just conditional. We use that to navigate life, but we need it. We need it. And yet we know it's not, it's not ultimate. And that's why these questions of the mind's possibilities are so fascinating. We know that this world we experience the vast majority of the time is not ultimate. It is mind blowing. You know, it's, this is, I guess, going to be an out there question, but it's, if we're, if we're talking about selecting among these many potentialities, it seems like there, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One is that there's the state of superposition and there's the potentialities, an infinite number. But at other times you discuss the possibility that there may be actual other dimensions that mm -hmm. we may crisscross. Mm -hmm. or that are running on parallel tracks. Do you have a sense which, or both, or? Well, the model that I write about in the book is the idea that uh, there are these endless ultimate other di dimensions in which stuff is playing out constantly and there's no limitation whatsoever. Our experience, of course, is, is singular. Um, I would say in the Schrodinger's cat experiment, the the cat feels like everything is normal and local. The cat has probably experienced a singular reality, but the observer is able to see through the benefit of this thought experiment, there's different realities going on here. So what I'm experiencing right now is, well, you know, I'm talking to Harv. It's, it's 1.07 p.m. in the afternoon here in New York City, and it's raining outside, and everything is, is as it is. And that's overwhelmingly persuasive, as it must be. But... Um, According to some of the models we've been talking about, that's just one of an infinite number of outcomes that are, that are occurring in the present. And it seems to me there is some degree of crisscrossing uh, among these dimensions, or it may be that the individual is capable from time to time of flipping his or her perspective, maybe from one dimension to another, maybe somebody who's considered a channeler or a psychic and, and, or, or possessed of some a capacity for ESP if they're legit maybe maybe that person has an ability that that I don't have that 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 can crisscross into into another frame of reference and thereby see things outside of this this artificial paradigm of linear time that we live within so you know that may be something that's going on and 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 yet the person is capable if 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 what's going on is legit of seeing something unstuck from time, but coming back into another perception of time and relating it to somebody. Maybe that's what happens if you get a hit on 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 something, uh, uh, whether it be a deck of tarot cards or a deck of Zener cards, which are used in ESP, and maybe it's not repeatable. But it not being repeatable doesn't mean it's not real. Uh, and, and the question that we face as seekers within the New Thought framework is, is there a means of, of repetition? Is there a method that seems to work for people uh, re reliably? You know, uh, and that's a very open question. Yeah, what, what are some of the implications for some of these ideas in terms of our day-to-day -day practice and experiments? Well, I, I hope that the chief implication is that the individual will feel that he or she is never without resources. I do think all of this amounts to a, a human ability potential, a human ability that is a plus ability compared to what we experience through day-to-day -day life. You know, in day-to-day -day life, we say, well, what do we got? You know, we got motor skill, we got cognition, we got accident, we got luck. Uh, and then if people are religiously inclined, they believe there's a, a, a agency to prayer, to faith. And I'm saying, okay, you know, yes to all that. And it's possible that in addition to that, intention in and of itself, you know, apropos of where we started our conversation, has a power. You know, it has a power. And how that intention is maximized in terms of its causative abilities is, is a question of perhaps what 
what arouses the individual. I, I, you know, if the individual is capable of attaining a feeling state, that may be the royal road to some sort of mental causation impacted by other factors, as we've been talking about. If the individual is capable of bringing everything within him or herself to a wish state, which I think I'm better at personally, that may be that plus state, again, mitigated by other factors. And so I, my hope is that the individual will never feel like he or she is left wholly uh, without devices. You know, society and culture define a lot of what we want in life, but, but as you just mentioned you, in this book, you said the price of admission to these things is really knowing that at a very deep and authentic level what you want and what you value. Yeah. Uh, how do we get past those cultural expectations to that deeper authentic level of desire? Well, it's funny because those expectations, they pull at us uh, very in a very localized, very compartmentalized way. Um, sure, we can, we can turn on a, a, a television show or watch a movie or look at some piece of media and say, oh, look, you know, those are the dominant social values molding my self-perception. And, and yet there's a more pernicious way that occurs, too, which is that plays out within our subcultures. So a person can be within a subculture um, and regard him or herself as a free thinker, an outsider, uh, a, an eccentric, a wise owl, whatever the case may be. And within that subculture that that, that person finds himself, him or herself, there are terrible pressures that might not be suited to your life, that simply might not be suited to your life. I am struck that there are certain things in life that might indeed and in fact make life better for a person in a dramatic way that a, an individual may not feel uh, comfortable availing him or herself of uh, because that feels uh, shallow or that feels like something that, that doesn't fit uh, his self-image. So. Uh, this can come in any number of ways, you know, it, it, and, and, and I think that we get locked into images of what the good life is supposed to be all the time. You know, I remember I had a therapist once and a good guy, a solid good guy, who asked me what I wanted in life and I responded to him frankly and he said to me, but that's superficial. And I said, look, you know, you and I have known one another for a lot of years. Do you really think I'm being superficial with you or am I just being honest? And I, I, I accepted his, his criticism to the extent that I listened to it, but I've never once changed my mind and I found that when I get more of what I want, I am happier, I am more convivial, I sleep better at night, I am less anxious. So I do believe that the sensitive individual, the mature individual is perfectly capable of knowing what he or she wants in life. Now, they may not like, some part of them may rebel against, may push against what that thing is. You know, that thing may strike them as, as compromising some part of their self-image. You know, uh, within the spiritual culture, we hear all the time how we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to behave. Within many reaches of the therapeutic culture, within the recovery culture, you name it. We hear all the time what we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to behave. But it could be that the thing that, that one's psyche really yearns for is very different from that. So I guess what I'm saying is it's super easy to take pot shots at the larger culture, like, you know, to, to watch something uh, in mass media and say, yeah, that's all fucked up, you know, as if I have some better vantage point. But look from within the subculture that you occupy and see what peer pressures, what orthodoxies within that subculture might be restraining you. This is the third of four interviews with author Mitch Horowitz about his new book, Daydream Believer, Unlocking the Ultimate Power of Your Mind. Next up, Mitch and I will be talking about time, if it's possible to transcend time, and even if it's desirable. We'll also discuss the Tarot Divination System, and how the 1960s rock group The Monkees inspired Mitch's book. Make sure to hit subscribe and like this video. 
It really helps to keep producing content like this. Also, make sure to visit my website, harvbishop.com, where there are several articles by Mitch and more than 160 articles on manifestation, new thought, social justice, and the paranormal. Links to the harvbishop.com website and to Mitch's new book, Daydream Believer, are in the description box below.